So in our conversations recently on Discord, I've noticed that people are struggling initially in reading a research article and then trying to figure out which information is important. And I don't want to make light of this. This is not a simple task. It is quite complicated and it takes some time to get used to. So the more you read, especially within your field and get used to the way that that specific journals are written and even specific types of studies. So as many of you have pointed out, quantitative studies and qualitative studies in some ways have different ways of even accessing exactly um, how to interpret the data that they present. So I, I think that's important to know about. Um, and so I sort of want to do a, a live demonstration of a cold reading of an article to help you see how I read the articles and give you some pointers that I think might help you as you read these articles so that you're not um, reading and rereading and rereading over and over again the same things. Uh, trying to help you focus on what the important pieces are and um, hopefully help that process feel a little bit smoother in the future. Um, so I've sort of titled this video, How Do I Read This Article and Know What's Important? Because I do sense that urgency and that frustration of trying to figure that out. And the first time you're dealing with uh, reading research articles, that can be quite difficult. So before we dive into that, though, I want to sort of give a broad overview of the structure, the basic structure of a research article, especially if it's well written, will follow this in a way that makes it a little bit easier to follow the flow from start to finish of the article. And it also helps you know which sections maybe you want to skip to, to focus your time and energy and what things to pay attention to. So uh, the first thing you're going to see is an introduction to the article. And usually that introduction is designed in order to first say, sort of at a broad level, this is a general problem that's happening and that will slowly get tapered down into something more specifically related to the study that is being described. And so at the end of that, there will usually be some kind of purpose statement uh, that's worded a little bit differently and less specific than the research question will be. So the purpose of that introduction is really to give a rationale of why the study should be done in the first place. So when you're thinking about the rationale, you should be thinking, what is it that makes this study important? Why would anybody care? It's not the same as the research question. The research question is the specifics of their investigation. The rationale is why are they doing it? Um, you know, and, and even saying something like, well, there's not much research on it. Okay, that's a rationale, not necessarily a good one. Maybe there's no research that has been done on it because it simply isn't that important. Um, so, then it dives into the literature review. The literature review is where it really will focus and tailor the literature review on what is necessary in order to understand the context of their study. So the researcher has already understood something about the field and the research that is described in the literature review is helping the reader to say, okay, now I know where you're coming from. This other stuff has been done. You're drawing on these theories that helps you make these particular assumptions. So for instance, if the study is about learning, um, there are some assumptions being made in that literature review in the specific portion about theoretical or conceptual grounding or framing, however they describe that, where they're saying, we think this is how people learn. And that is necessarily going to have implications for how they carry out the study and also how they filter the results that they see. Um, and then the research question, it may not be worded as a question. It could be a statement. Um, it could be worded as a research aim. So e either of those is fine. It doesn't have to be a question. And in fact, I, I 
urge you not to actually word it as a question in your summary that you might write about the this, the articles that you're reading unless it is stated as a question in the actual paper because then it sort of begs the question like, oh, well, was this a direct quote or was it not? Then it will dive into method. And in the method, it will describe the participants, the setting, and included in there, it should have information about how these people were sampled. Were they recruited? Were they randomly um, selected? How does that look? What are the data sources and collection procedures? And those should be all related back to the research question. And then the analysis method. What does it... What did they actually do to analyze the data? If it was quantitative, they're going to list some kind of statistical test um, or process of some kind that, that they used. If it's qualitative, then there will also be some kind of process described there. And those will look very different depending on whether it's qualitative or quantitative. And then after that will be the findings or the results section. And in that section, you should be looking for, well, how did they answer their research question? Can I trace it back? And is there evidence um, to support their answer to the research question? And then in the last section, the discussion or implications, um, the, the implications should relate directly back to findings. So you want to make sure to look for that. What are the implications of this study? Not what are implications of what they found in their literature review. It should be very specifically tied to the results of their study. Uh, the same goes for future research. Future research should be informed by what they found. So now I've found this, but it falls short here and we need more research. Okay, basic structure. All right, so I'm going to try to do a cold read here. So uh, right now, something that I am wanting to focus my reading time on is understanding um, how data is being used. So my, my most um, interest research-wise is in statistics education. So let's say I type in statistics education and big data. Let's see what comes up here. So... Uh, let's add middle school to that. And I'm putting these in quotes. I'm putting and in between them. I don't know if you can see that very well on the screen there. Um, because the and requires that all of it be there. The quotes require the entire phrase to appear. So I'm saying I want the phrase statistics education to appear. I want big data to appear. And I want middle school to appear in the results. All three. All right, so let's see what we have. Let's see if I can find one that looks interesting. So I want to find one that I haven't read before. All right, so let's look at this one here. Um, promoting modeling and covariational reasoning among secondary school students in the context of big data. Uh, this is a 2017 article, so it hasn't been out that long, um, especially when it takes sometimes up to two years to even get published. So if it only came out in 2017, it makes sense that right now it only would have six citations. and Statistics education is a rel relatively small field. So let's read through this. And when I say let's, I mean I'm going to show you how I would read through it. And as I read through this, I am also going to start taking notes here about what I'm reading so that you can see what I'm paying attention to. All right. So let me make this a little bigger so you can see it on the screen as well. And I picked something from my own field because as you start to read in your field, you're going to pick up on things that maybe um, other people that are not in your field wouldn't. So 
it does help with the reading. So as you read more, you're going to start picking up on who people's names are in the field, and that will help you understand where they're coming from and allow you to read less. All right, so the first thing I do is look at who published this. Um, I don't know who either of these people are. So this will give you some indication of how I might read something where I'm not as familiar with someone's work. And the first thing I do is I look at the abstract. In this study, we follow students modeling and covariational reasoning in the context of learning about big data. A three-week unit was designed to allow 12th grade students in a mathematics course to explore big and mid-sized data <clears throat> using concepts such as trend and scatter to describe the relationships between variables in a multivariate setting. In multivariate settings. <clears throat> Okay, this gives me some context. Students' emergent ideas were followed. When I see this, emergent ideas were followed, that tells me that probably this is a qualitative study. Um, because if the ideas were emergent, it would be really hard to measure that quantitatively unless they were there quantifying um, data that was observational in nature. <clears throat> were followed along a varied learning trajectory that included computer-supported collaborative and inquiry-based approaches using visualization tools and statistical software to explore data and fit a suitable trend and student presentations of investigations. Okay, so in my head I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be seeing as data um, descriptions of students working in the classroom, uh, working with computers, working in groups, using statistical software in order to create a presentation to describe what they learned about the data that they investigated. Okay. Findings show progress in some components of students' reasoning and modeling of covariation and indicate which features of the unit design <clears throat> might contribute to it. So they're trying to describe students' reasoning and how it connects to their modeling of the covariation that they observed in the data, and trying to pull out the features that may have helped to uh, create the successes or the features that may have created challenges. That's what I'm thinking in my head may be happening. And uh, I get another indication of that from this keyword that says design of learning environment. And then representational gestures also further tells me it's probably qualitative because they're looking at students' gestures as a component of their analysis. So how were students pointing or using their hands? Okay. I'm not going to read the introduction. I've got a pretty good idea just from the abstract of what this is going to look like. Um, theoretical framework. So uh, I'm not as concerned about that. I think the most important thing I would do first is skip down to, okay, as you can see, you can see pictures of transcript as I'm scrolling through, pictures of people at the board. This is definitely looking qualitative. And discussion. The discussion is helpful because I can tell what kinds of things that they're saying at the end. So the first paragraph usually is a summary of the results. We studied the characteristics of students' modeling of covariational reasoning in the context of big and multivariate data, how it changed during the three-week program. This was something not included in the abstract, I don't think. And what design features might contribute to their covariational reasoning. All right. That sounds like a purpose. Findings about 12th grade students' modeling of covariation in the context of big data show that students progressed describing Covariational reading, reasoning and modeling terms, attending in particular to direction, shape, and strength. In terms of shape, even after learning and experimenting with fitting nonlinear curves, many students demonstrated a tendency to fit a linear model even at times when the relationship was curvilinear or not linear. Our observations reinforce findings from previous studies. In the final activity of the unit, the three Presenting groups represented and described the relationships in bivariate terms, where the homogeneity and level of vocabulary and sophistication in presentation throughout the class. 
Although students were encouraged to use multivariate tools and were given tools designed to allow multivariate reasoning, Gapminder in the first activity and Insight in the last, students in the final activity presented arguments based on bivariate relationships, even when making a pitch about associations involving multiple variables. They didn't yet utilize the knowledge and skill they learned of representing association between three variables in one graph, possibly owing to the lack of proficiency with the tool. Um, okay. We believe developing student confidence in multivariate reasoning will, careful, will require careful scaffolding to allow them to acquire fluency with, for example, making conclusions about a relationship between two variables after the data have been separated into subsets by the values of a third variable. The availability of time as a third dynamic variable in Gapminder seemed to lend itself more easily to multivariate reasoning, and observing how a relationship evolves over time is perhaps a natural introduction of a third variable. Students' tendency to use linear models in situations where curves would provide a better fit to the data demonstrates the need for great, greater guided support in their development of a more flexible approach to modeling. Okay. Uh, I get the idea of the findings here. And then here's, I'm just looking at the first words of each of the paragraphs to see if anything pops out that looks like I should read it. Um, representational gestures were found to be another embodiment of expressing statistical reasoning and demonstrating covariational reasoning and the modeling of it. A strong association described as when I can put my hand on it adds another overlay of understanding to our interpretation of students' reasoning and brings to life through gestures and verbal expression a conceptual system. So they found that students' um, representational gestures were important in making sense of their reasoning. Okay. Actually, this first sentence here looks like now they're getting into implications because the, the article is coming to an end here. Evolving ideas from this study contribute to. Okay, now I'm expecting them to say, this is what we added to the existing research. Contribute to the discussion of different aspects of modeling, of covariation at the secondary school level, including how technology tools that provide opportunities for multivariate reasoning and flexible modeling can support and utilize emerging understanding in these areas, how we might integrate big data in addition to smaller data, and how we might develop statistical thinking through the use of current data sets involving measurement relative to global and regional issues. So this sentence here is telling me, giving me an idea of how this might be cited in the future. Um, but they're adding to this sort of uh, description that already exists in the literature. And remember, I haven't read the literature review for this study, so that tells me what I might find in the literature review. Starting from our findings, several additional questions can be proposed. So now it's telling me about future research. So, concepts students use when modeling covariation. For example, how to promote a more flexible approach to modeling particularly shape. And I know from my own knowledge of the field that this is an issue in the field. It's a complicated thing to make sense of. And how to encourage the development of facility and multivariate reasoning, perhaps by developing facility and asking critical context questions that promote the need for multivariate reasoning. Another thing that I know we don't know a whole lot about. And how to encourage evaluation of a model as part of the modeling process. Our study suggests an exploratory design sequence. So they're even proposing a specific design to a study for developing covariational reasoning. Blah, blah, blah. Our findings are limited to our modest attempt in the settings described. Limitations also arise from the difference in the demands of activities one and five that might be in some sense not comparable since using insight is more technical and involves modeling tools. All right. And then the last sentence, we suggest that further development of the unit to a longer curriculum with additional conceptual and technical scaffolds would yield a greater impact on students' covariational reasoning and modeling of covariation in a multivariate environment. All right. So in here, um, I did not get to the implications. I didn't see that, but that's an important thing. 
because if I'm going to look at the findings, it's nice to know which findings are the most important. And they're going to pull uh, the findings that are most important as connections to their implications. So um, this is a paragraph that I skipped here. So I'm going to go back through it and I'm only going to look at um, sort of the first portion of each sentence here. Um, and see if I can find anything about implications on practice. Uh, so it, they don't really offer any implications for practice, it looks like. They mostly offer suggestions for future research. Um, and it could be because they just feel like they don't know enough that they feel like this can be impacting practice yet. So this is an important piece. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it here. And this is going to get quotation marks around it and a page number for now so I can go back to it later. It was page 186. And then up above it I'm going to write um, Future research implication. Okay. And then this last statement. Now, whenever I actually write this up, I will not write it up quite like this. page 186 as well. And actually the first one was page 185 through 186. Okay, so there's implications. So I am hoping that I'll see some things connected to that. So if I'm thinking about rationale, and then I want to talk about method or uh, research questions. And then something about method and then findings. All right. Now let's go back to the article and, and look a little deeper. So I like to start by looking for the research question, even though um, Whenever I've asked you to do the summary, really I'm asking you to do the rationale first. But the research question will help me understand how I might write the rationale. So I'm looking right above the method in order to see if I can find some kind of research question. There's not one explicitly noted. But the previous paragraph, right before the method, usually will have some sort of purpose statement, a research aim or something. And I see here, um, it doesn't look like there's anything here. But let's look at the first sentence. In this exploratory study, representational gestures provide additional insight into students' reasoning about covariation and modeling, along with their textual, numerical, and graphical expressions. When students are faced with complex data, blah, 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 we identify gestures to the similarity to the shape of the model described by the student and are as interpreted to be connected to the main modeling concepts. Okay. So if it's not there, I am guessing it is going to be just prior to it. 
So maybe they put it at the end of the introduction. In this study, we examine a unit that was designed to promote secondary school students' covariational reasoning and modeling of and for covariational reasoning. Students worked in multivariate settings using big data or data with some characteristics of big data, such as greater size originating from different sources and multivariate. The goal was to develop students' ability to make sound conclusions from the data. So I'm actually going to, um, for now, copy this piece. And it's going to copy that part in the middle. I'll have to delete it. But this is page 163 to 164. delete this part page 163 to 164 and here I'm going to change this and say research purpose because it wasn't worded as a question all right so why were they doing this Why did they design a unit to promote secondary students' covariational reasoning and modeling of and for covariational reasoning? Um, so, let's see if it says anything here. Current trends include a growing awareness of the need for data-driven decision-making and increasing attention to the availability of big data and its potential to significantly alter database decision-making process, decision processes. Sure. But then the question could be, well, why 12th graders? Current opportunities to experience big data in statistics education are limited in tertiary education. That means um, initial higher education institutions, initial college education, and are even more so at the secondary school level. Coupled with the growing attention to big data, there is a growing recognition of the need for students to develop basic literacy with such data. So, um, and the need to develop frameworks to guide their learning, as illustrated by the pioneering attempt of Philip and colleagues to design activities using data that have some of the characteristics of big data at the secondary school label, label, level with mobile learning. So here in this first sentence, it looks like they've basically said, um, Students don't have enough opportunities to do this in college, much less at the secondary school level, and yet it's really needed. Goals of the analysis of big data include exploring hidden structures in the data and understanding features that are common across subgroups. As a consequence, facility and covariational reasoning, both bivariate and multivariate, is essential in making sense of mid-size and big data. So the covariational reasoning piece comes in. Modeling for exploring the association between variables is an essential tool to understand, discover, and describe covariational phenomena. All right. So basically how I might summarize that is to say, and let's see, what were the authors' names again? Gill and Gibbs. And I suggest that you start sentences like this because it helps make it clear who is speaking and who is not speaking. I am saying what they said, and I'm talking about them. And they're the ones that are making this claim, not me. I'm just simply restating their claim. Gill and Gibbs argued that opportunities to engage in covariational reasoning with multivariate and large scale databases are important for the statistical literacy of or for advancement 
of statistical literacy. Okay. They further noted that opportunities to do so at the secondary and tertiary level are um, not typical yet. There are calls for increases in these opportunities. Okay, because they cited people who were saying this is good, right? All right, there's my rationale. Then I might say, therefore, their study aimed to And then we can do this. Examine a unit that was designed to promote secondary school students covariational reasoning and modeling of and for covariational reasoning. Period. Now I'm ready for the method section. So in the method section, So I, I don't need to read this part in order to write the summary here, but there are some important things in here, like how they design the modeling of covariational reasoning if they're trying to understand how people are reasoning in this way. Um, these are some things that they used and, and it would be important if you wanted to make more sense of their analysis. So um, myself, I would find this to be interesting, but as far as the summary goes, it's not as important to understand this part, but personally, it is important for me to understand it. But for now, I'm going to skip over this. The method. Oh, and look at that. I missed this before. There's the two research questions. Let's see if we have captured it. What are the characteristics of students' covariational reasoning and modeling in the context of big and multivariate data, and how did it change during the program? What design features promoted their emergent covariational reasoning and modeling. So actually, these might be something that later I would want to put into as a quote um, into the summary. If I can't figure out how to parse that down, this is page 169. All right. Participants, two 12th grade classes, age 17 to 18. Classes were of size 25 and 30 in Ontario Secondary School. So these are important details to include. Um, two 12th grade classrooms in Ontario. Most of the students were above average academic level. And that tells me maybe they were in an AP statistics course. I'm not sure. Results are given from the focal class, which usually had the second iteration of the activities. Oh, so really they're only talking about 30 students. We focus primarily on six groups of, of students, but attended also to discussions with additional students in class. Okay. Students were enrolled in a 12th grade class called Mathematics for Data Management, one of three elective university preparatory math courses. That makes sense as a 12th grade course. The students did not have much experience with statistics. They had not encountered data in their math classes since the unit on mathematics of a straight line in ninth grade. So it's been four years since they experienced data. Um, all right, then it talks about what they might have experienced. Okay, so the important pieces from this participant section is um, that it was at a secondary school in Ontario, 12th grade class, and it focused on one course uh, with 30 students in it, it looks like, or sorry, uh, this course with 25. 
the focal class in one, 25 students. I'm not 100% sure about that until I see the data, but the study involved design and implementation of learning environment for statistics unit over six 72 minute sessions for each class. Okay, and five activities. So that would be important to include. So you can include this. Uh, for now, I'm thinking two 12th grade classes in a secondary school in Ontario, in a mathematics for data management course with students who did not have much experience with statistics. There's one sentence, right? And then um, you could say there was a, an intervention that included five activities that were completed over six 72 minute classes. And then all right. Learning trajectory. Learning trajectory is just an expected pathway that students might take. All right. Some of this is not as important to include in a summary, although it's important information to know. Okay, they're going to elaborate on the activities. Okay, for a two-page summary, actually describing the activities themselves is not all that important um, because there's just not room to describe all five activities here. So the important thing is to describe um, the general perspective of the activities or general content, which um, it looks like they're each activity has its own data sets, maybe. <clears throat> All right, I, I wouldn't include too much from that here. Data and analytic methods. All right. All activities and discussions were videotaped. All right, so data sources. Um, they videotaped classroom discussion and groups group activities. So they're videotaping interactions. Um, <clears throat> says not all interactions were captured, although video data is considered to be a company. Okay, not that big of a deal. And then <clears throat> additionally, a pre and post test were administered. Quantitative analysis was carried out on a sample from the responses to the pretest and post -tests. Oh, but it is not reported here due to the relatively low quality and student effort and rate of completion. So they actually didn't uh, don't report on any of that. So I wouldn't even I wouldn't even include that. Um, so, but they have video data from these six classes over the course of the students completing these five activities student presentations and selected discussions were transcribed and analyzed using content analysis, capturing the main ideas connected to the theoretical framework that emerged from the research data. Okay, so they transcribed and, um, and then analyzed the transcripts. And then they coded the transcripts for evidence of covariational reasoning and aspects of modeling for covariational reasoning. So that might be another important thing to say. Um, so one further sentence could be, they transcribed student dis uh, presentations and discussions and then coded them, and maybe this is where a direct quote is helpful. We conducted triangulation of coding between first and second authors. All right. 
Don't need to go into depth with their coding processes for a two-page summary. This is a student created image, it looks like. All right. In some instances, we used interpretive microanalysis, a detailed analysis relates to a student's verbal, gestural, and symbolic actions. Um, I think I probably wouldn't go into detail about that for the purpose of the summary. All right. Yeah, that, that's about it, I think, for this. I think I would talk about those things. And then for the results, it's helpful to look at the big headings. So there's a level two heading, here's a level three heading. I would look at these and decide which things are important. So remember, there are two research questions, right? What are the characteristics of their reasoning and modeling and how did it change? And what design features promoted the emergent reasoning and modeling? So covariational reasoning and modeling in students' first presentations. Remember, the goal is to describe change. So I might be looking through here. Um, and then it says table three gives the opening statement for each of these groups. Table four gives a summary of the characteristics of covariational reasoning. So I might go, okay, let me go look at table four. Covariational reasoning. Trend, shape, slope, direction, strength, clusters, scatter, outlier. Okay. And then the L is the other thing they coded for. I kind of skipped over that, but um, whether they did something explicitly, literally, or both. So that's what these L and E mean. Okay. And group three is not included here. So then I might kind of skip through this. Class discussion of a nonlinear relationship. We introduce the class to a plot showing data with clearly nonlinear relationship. And remember, in the discussion earlier, we found that students struggled with this, and some of them tried to apply a linear relationship to a nonlinear one. Um, so we kind of already know what they found here, but I would be looking in particular for things that they found that relate back to these research questions. So since one of them were about the characteristics, I might look at the end of that section. So. Um, And here they don't actually provide a super descriptive answer. So I'm going to go to the next one, class discussion of nonlinear relationship. Analysis of this discussion reveals, this sounds promising, that they may be answering a research question. Interesting use of gestures accompanying verbal expressions by three different students. Okay. And then... I'm skipping down because that doesn't sound like it's directly answering. All right. Summary of presentations and discussion in the initial phase. So I might look at, the, look at this, see what they're finding, these characteristics. Further emergence of ideas. Further, uh, so they haven't talked about how this changed, right? Characteristics and how they change over time. So that's what I'm looking for. How are they answering this question? Further promotion of ideas in students' reasoning took place in the recreating the scatter plot from the trend exercise. So I'm going to keep scrolling. All right, continuation and change in perception of modeling for covariation. All right, let me scroll down. I wanna see what they say changed. All right. This looks promising here. Students' use of 
characteristics of models for covariation from the first to the fifth activity. There was a demonstrated increase in the knowledge and perception of the characteristics of trend, particularly the shape, direction, and strength. That is a potentially direct answer to the research question. That sort of is a summary of that. All groups could articulate the direction and its meaning and relate to the strength of the association. Students' ability to recognize clusters and outliers and relate to their roles in specifying appropriate model and how well it fit either did not progress or was less relevant. However, this sounds like it could be important. Students' discussion of scatter was more substantial in the final presentations than in the beginning activity of the unit. So, that sounds like they've answered the question with that statement along with this one here. The design perspective. So that was the second question. What design features promoted this to happen? All right. And it even says very explicitly, this quest section addresses the second research question. Thank you for reminding me. I like when they do that. We present our evidence-based conjectures from which we would like to highlight three main areas of emergent reasoning. All right, this is sounding good. Right up front, just tell me. Then I can read the details. Covariational reasoning in a multivariate setting. And two, seeing models of covariation beyond linear. And three, modeling of covariation. Table 8 gives a summary of the design features that might have been instrumental in promoting them. Table 8 is important then. Table 8 is where I might draw for, from in responding to this in my summary. Um, covariational reasoning in a multivariate setting. So there's the three things. Using statistics tools. Being able to see three or more variables in a representation. So using tools that allow them to see three or more things um, and see things in a multivariate setting. Okay, helpful, the visualization tool. Class discussions on presentations, it says were helpful. Introducing nonlinear representations <clears throat> were helpful to see models of covariation, promoting the use of nonlinear modeling tools, introducing introduction to different multivariate data sets. So these are all things that they thought were important and I'd have to go through and pick how to say which of these things are most important. I, I can't put all of this in the summary. It would be too long. Okay. And then I would want to make sure that whatever I put in the finding section, that I have a finding that I can directly tailor to one of these implications. So what did they say further research need to focus on? How to promote a more flexible approach to modeling, particularly shape, and how to encourage the development of facility and multivariate reasoning, perhaps by developing facility and asking critical questions. And how to encourage evaluation of a model as part of the modeling process. So I want to make sure that in my findings, there's something about how that thing either didn't happen well, or that there's something that they did that they want to repeat somewhere else. And then um, putting that in a longer curriculum with additional conceptual and technical scaffolds. So we know that they struggled with some of the technology. So make sure that that's in the findings, that they struggle with the technology. And then here you can remind the reader, remember they struggle with this? Yeah, now they're saying that we need more research on that. Okay. All right. Hopefully this is helpful. Um, I've gone through this whole paper pretty much and notice that it's not an in-depth reading of it, but I read it enough that I need to pull, can pull out the main ideas. And then my next task would be, okay, now let me go in and really focus on the details and make sense of this um, rather than just pulling them out. But the important thing to do is get this part down because once you know what this is, then you can make sure to align your method and your findings directly to that. And then um, doing the implications ahead of time, ahead of time helps to sort of filter the findings that you're looking at. So not only are you looking for findings that answer the research question, but that also help you respond to these implications. All right, hopefully it's helpful. Let me know um, and I'll see you guys in Discord.